Why do we bother? Let's do better than that. Why do we bother to make things beautiful? Why do we bother about the way things look rather than just what they do? Why do we bother about color, design, form, balance, harmony, aesthetics? But bother we do. We go to a great deal of trouble to do these things beyond their functional utility, their mere practical use. If we make a jug or a bowl or a vase or a blanket or a rug, in addition to how they might help keep us warm or hold liquid, we might also worry about do the colors go well together? Is the design good? Is it a nice shape? Does it somehow please me aesthetically? Why do we bother? Why do we go to so much trouble to do this? Well, here's a case study for you. Here is a rug made round about 1900, 1910 in Red Mesa, Arizona, by the Navajo, a Native American tribe who live in the desert southwest of the United States. Hold on to that term, desert, because it underlines how much trouble they go to to make blankets and rugs such as these, despite the fact that they'd be just as useful as ways of keeping us warm or covering the floor, that if they didn't go to this tremendous trouble with color, balance, design, texture, symmetry, doing their best with a few scraggy sheep that can live in the desert, using lots of water, Yes, the clue is in the word desert, uh, to prepare dyes and cleaning processes, vegetable dyes, uh, now color. However they do it, they go to a great deal of trouble to do it. Why do they do it? Well, because it's important to them. The Navajo have a concept. It's called hojong. And I've put it up there on the screen with its wonderful diacritical marks because it doesn't really translate straightforwardly into English. It means a, a combination of things. It's a combination of beauty, yes, balance, harmony, togetherness. Well, hojon, really. It's a concept which turns up in the best translation you can get of the famous Navajo prayer, where the consistent refrain is, walk in beauty, walk in beauty. But it's about so much more than beauty. It's about, well, it's about hojon. So this leaves us with some good questions. Why do we go to so much trouble? But also, what can we learn from this? Because here we've got another example of a Navajo rug where somebody has taken the raw materials of daily existence and made them into something better. You take the world as you find it and make it into something better. So it seems to me that weaving is both an act and a metaphor. It's an act in that we take something and make something better, not just in terms of utility, but in the way it looks, and the values that it communicates. And I think this is hugely important. We can learn from creativity. We can learn a great deal about utopia, therefore, from aesthetics. The first thing we can learn from aesthetics about utopia is a very important point. Utopia is a process not a destination. The Navajo will tell you that weaving is a process as much as a destination. In terms of utopia, this is very, very important because I want to stress that utopia, as I see it, is the way we set about something. It's a thought process. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of dreaming. Rather than saying, here's my utopia. We're going to go for it at all costs. And anything I do in pursuit of that utopia is therefore going to be justified. This can be a problem because my utopia can be your dystopia. And if I justify everything in pursuit of my utopia, then that's a recipe for not just authoritarianism, it's also a recipe for totalitarianism, which I suggest is non-utopian. The other thing we can learn about utopia from aesthetics is the importance of form. Here's a picture of one of my aesthetic heroes, the great critic, theorist, designer, Roger Fry, a big name in the history of the courthold. And Fry taught us over 100 years ago to be increasingly aware of the fact that human emotion and human communication in the fine arts and the visual arts is increasingly communicated by form rather than content, the way things are rather than what they particularly show. And he said that this, that this aesthetic emotion was something unique and special 
to, communi to the communication between humans, which humans were in a particular position to understand, to learn from, and to grow from. And for Fry, form was a universal constant despite its local differences. For example, he collected African dancing masks. This one's in the Courtauld collection, uh, ex Roger Fry. And he claims that it has the same formal properties as, say, oh, well, here's one of his own designs for a rug uh, around about the time of the Amiga workshops. And he would argue, and we can argue, therefore, that this constant of form is something we can see continuing not just from African masks or to Amiga group rugs, but right the way through post-impressionist painting to more contemporary work in prints by people like Sir Terry Frost. It's not what it shows, it's how it is, and yet it works. Pause for thought. Where does creativity come from? Well, there are two fundamentalist answers to this big question, where does creativity come from? One, fundamental Tourette's answer. The markets, the markets, the markets. There is a fundamentalist belief in our society that the markets explain and justify everything. Well, there's two things wrong with that. They don't. <laughs> and they don't. <laughs> so we can use an American dollar bill as a good way of thinking about where utopia doesn't come from. It doesn't come from the markets. But also, look carefully up at the top of the one. It says, in God we trust. I want to suggest to you that utopia, when we work towards utopia, does not come or should not come from a belief in the supernatural. We should not delegate our responsibilities to the supernatural. We may consider the lilies of the field, but as terms of practical advice, that is actually pretty useless. Do not delegate to the supernatural. What I'm not saying is that we can't learn anything from scripture and from the culture of religion and other myths. Take the story of Adam and Eve, for example. Everybody knows that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, and everything was going absolutely swimmingly. They could eat whatever they want, have a terrific time, no responsibilities, didn't have to work at all, as long as they didn't eat of the forbidden fruit. Whatever you do, don't do that. Well... Eve tempts Adam, they eat of the forbidden fruit, and they are thrown out of the Garden of Eden, and life for them and everyone else, having eaten the apple, goes completely pear-shaped ever since. No, actually. Um, if you read the book of Genesis, see what it actually says. You see, it's not about sex. God says, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. The day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I have to say, what's wrong with that? If that's the forbidden fruit, I want some of that. Who doesn't want their eyes to be opened? Who doesn't want to be as gods? Who doesn't want to know the difference between good and evil? How can you pursue utopia if you don't know, or at least consider, the difference between good and evil. So, in the utopianism as process which I'm advocating today, let's see the fall as an elevation. Let's see as it, it as a, a release, a liberation from the ignorance of the Garden of Eden. This is essentially a very similar myth to the Hellenic myths of hubris inevitably followed by Nemesis. My favorite story being, of course, Prometheus, who stole, yes, he stole the secret of fire from the gods and was punished horribly on a daily basis forever and a day. Would you rather live without fire? Thank you, Prometheus. Hooray for hubris. You're familiar with this image, the creation of Adam from the Sistine ceiling. It's a terrific image to celebrate. But what, in my advocacy of utopia, we celebrate here isn't the creation of Adam, in which you do, I do not literally believe, but in the creativity of Michelangelo, in which I believe very deeply. 
the creativity of the Renaissance, the celebration of the creativity of humankind. That, in my vision of utopia, my advocacy for utopia as a thought process, as a way of thinking, is the message of the Sistine Ceiling. Okay, if it doesn't come from the two obvious places where everybody knows everything comes from, either God or the free markets, where does creativity come from? Well, I'm going to suggest there are two places where we might find creativity, from which creativity might arise. First of all, you thought I was going to say this, psychoanalysis. Basic Freudian psychoanalysis talks about intrapsychic conflict, the idea that we all have a conflict going on inside our minds between the id, the ego, and the superego. Put more realistically, that it's conflict between our drives, our very base and very human drives, and our civilizing insects. I want to, but you mustn't. I want to, you mustn't. And that this interpsychic conflict reveals itself in all sorts of things. Freud thought particularly dreams were the product, and symptoms were the product of interpsychic conflict. Well, what if our cultural texts, what if our paintings, our rugs, our fairy stories, our stamp collections are symptoms, if they're dreams, that the works of culture, whether high culture, low culture, popular culture we see all around us, are dreams, the product of intrapsychic conflict? Well, it sounds a bit fancy, doesn't it? Uh, you maybe may not impress the Navajo with your teams of Freudian psychoanalytical structure. But they had their own way of talking about it. They still do. I've talked to you about Hergen, this concept of balance, order, harmony, in which everything comes together, which is fundamental to the Navajo values, world vision, and the Navajo creation story, the Diné Bachané. But the Diné Bachané is also populated by a contrary figure, Mai, the coyote. Mai, the coyote, is a trickster. He's a bringer of disorder. And he scampers around the whole of Navajo mythology, creating chaos where the Navajo are trying to create Hojon. You put the two together, and you get Navajo arts, values, culture. And the Navajo rug is, I would argue, a consequence of Hojon, despite and increasingly, or importantly, because of Mai'i. Without Mai'i, you wouldn't have Hojon. Again, this is telling us something about utopia, about making life better today. Another area I want to suggest you think about for utopia, where it comes from and how we might think about it, how we might work towards it, is through utopian critical theory. And another of my heroes, alongside Roger Fry, Ernst Bloch. Bloch talked about two very important things for us. The idea to which I've already alluded, wishful images in the mirror. The idea that visions of utopia are already all around us. They're everywhere. We might do this consciously, but they're there. A fairy story. Woody Allen's Annie Hall, where Woody Allen turns to the camera and says, if only life were like this. According to Bloch, we say, why not? Let's walk towards making life as good on life, in Earth, in our daily lives, as it is in the arts, as it is in culture, as it is in fairy stories, as it is in the perfect stamp collection, in the perfect Western, in which good will triumph over evil and order will triumph over disorder. He was also an advocate of atheism and Christianity. Bloch believed that only an atheist could be a good Christian and only a good Christian could be an atheist. To do this involved taking scripture seriously. But his reading of the Old Testament and the New Testament was one in which humankind gradually grows up and out of the garden and up and out of the idea of God. This may be a familiar concept to those of you who've read the Dark Materials trilogy by Philip Pullman, a children's author somebody who's writing wishful images in the mirror. You might say, why couldn't life be like that? At the end of the Dark Materials trilogy, Will and Lyra are sitting in the botanical gardens in Oxford, on a bench still beloved and visited by tourists, as though this actually happened, but that's another story. It's a story. Stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And this story 
has Will and Lyra, having put the world to rights, triumphed over evil, as all teenagers do. Well, we've changed the world. We've got rid of the threat of authority and organized religion and the wickedness that they thought it brought. What are we going to put in its place? The answer, not the kingdom, but the republic of heaven. A human-centered universe. As Ernst Bloch concluded one of his great works on utopia, it really is up to us. I put it to you that we may consider the lilies of the field, and that's wonderful, but coming back to the Navajo, rugs don't make themselves. As Bloch put it, life has been put into our hands. Thank you.